There's a scripture that says the son of man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And so I don't expect him, but yet I expect him. I live as though he's not coming back. And I live as though he's coming back today. What do you mean by that? Well, I stay busy with the things of the Lord and try to stay focused on those things, knowing that he can return any moment. But yet I know that it could be a while from now that he returns. And so we live expectantly. We ex expect the Lord to come, but yet we expect him uh, to hesitate or Maranatha uh, coming at a time when we don't expect him to come. Jacob's trouble. In Matthew chapter 24, I want to read to you what it says there concerning uh, the last days. It says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. So Jesus, as he walked the earth, didn't even know when the Lord was coming back. Not even the angels know. Only the father knew at that moment when that day would happen. And he says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the son of man. Now think about that for a second. As the days of Noah, the hearts were cold towards Christianity or towards God. Uh, there was evil in the culture. It was so evil that their thoughts and their imaginations were so corrupt that even the children were corrupt. Think about our culture today. It would be like the days of Noah. There was no compassion, no love, no mercy for anyone and you see it all around us. I went to, finally, I went to, to the uh, city planning department, our city here, Harupa Valley. And I'm standing there waiting, and the guy's calling names off the list. And I'm thinking, okay, I got to get on that list somehow. So I'm waiting. He sees me waiting. They all see me waiting. And then all of a sudden, a group of guys come in, and they see him calling names. So they just jump up in front. Oh, we need to put our name on there. And they just put their name down. And I'm thinking, I've been standing here the whole time, and they just bypassed me, didn't say, oh, we need to put our name down. Did you put your name down already? You know, type of thing. It was totally me get out of the way because I need to be called upon right now to get help. And that's just the day that we're living in. People don't care about anyone else but themselves. As I shared just this last week, the, the, the one lady that uh, came here, just totally about self, self-centeredness, a lack of love and so forth. Like the days of Noah, not revival. There were no revivals in the days of Noah. Revival wasn't even mentioned in, in the days of Noah. No, it was wickedness and evil that God had to bring his judgment down upon the earth and then allow Israel to go through the storm, the tribulation. And that's a typology of Israel going through the tribulation period while the world is being judged. He also says, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark did not know until the flood came and took them away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. That's pretty clear, right? We don't necessarily need to see a revival. It's going to be like that, and, and we're ripe for that. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be gathering or grinding at the mills. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. And so you get the idea that two are going on with life. Two are just living their lives out. Two individuals that are Jews, as I said earlier. Now, there's a possibility that, and I'm going to repeat this for, for uh, the recording's sake. There's a possibility that these two are Jews. I mean, obviously, they're Jews. These two believe in the Messiah. They're from the same backgrounds, have the same uh, philosophy and, and, and religion and so forth, and yet one is taken and one is left. And so it could be just a possibility that, that um, the one that is taken is the one that's been prepared, and the one that was left was not prepared, though they knew the Lord. And you get the idea of the parables of the ten virgins, right? The ones that were prepared for the coming were prepared, but the ones that were not were not ready. And so there's a possibility that, that some may stay for the tribulation period. I don't want to stay. I want to be ready. I want my lamp lit and I want it um, bright so that I know when the Lord comes. Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. But now, but know this, that is that if the master of the house has known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. 
you not expect. So there's a warning for us as Christians. This is to us. This, this isn't to the world. This is to the believer. Jesus is talking to us here that we need to be ready even today because we're that much closer to his return than ever before. So we need to be ready. We find in chapter 30 here, which is an interesting chapter, it talks about the restoration of the Jews from Babylon after their captivity. You remember, they've been captured, put into bondage because of their sins, because of their idolatry, and God hates idolatry. He's very clear he hates idolatry. He despises it. And so they're brought into captivity, but there's a day that he's going to let them go. After 70 years, he will take them back to the land. Now, at the same time, though, here in this chapter, he's also going to talk about a future event where he will regather Israel, but they will have to be purified, in a sense, by going through the great tribulation period, and he'll talk about the Messiah. So after many years of wandering amongst all the nations, he'll finally purify them and, and bring them to a point where they acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah and they will uh, be restored before the Lord and serve him with all of their heart. The time of Jacob's trouble is a period of seven years coming at the close of the tribulation dispensation, followed immediately by the return of Christ in glory to set up his kingdom. So the, the time of Jacob's trouble is a seven-year period, and you can read this in the book of Daniel, seven weeks. And, and there's one week yet to be fulfilled, seven years. Uh, weeks of weeks, which speaks of years, so seven whole years of tribulation. This tribulation period is, is considered to be Jacob's trouble, taking Jacob in the Old Testament, but not the literal man Jacob, but Israel, speaking of Israel themselves. They will have to go through this tribulation period of seven years. Now, we believe as Calvary Chapel that God will rapture the church up before the tribulation period. It's what we call the pre-tribulation rapture. We're not mid and we're not post, yet there's some believe that, that in the middle of the tribulation, the church will be raptured up, so we might go through a little bit. And then some believe we will go through it and then be um, raptured at the second coming of the Lord. Now, those that believe at the end, those are the, one, those are the Christian churches that believe that Israel is no longer in the picture. And if Israel is no longer in the picture, then who gets to go through the tribulation period if the church is Israel? Guess what? The church, it doesn't make any sense. So that is the tribulation period. That's Jacob's trouble. And, and the first three and a half years is, is going to be interesting in that there's going to be prosperity, there's going to be peace, there's going to be a rising of leadership and so forth. The answers uh, will be there for all the questions. And then all of a sudden, boom, God's wrath will begin. Uh, the Antichrist will rise up and he'll, he'll uh, sit himself into the temple and claim to be God himself and demand worship from Israel and from the world. And then God's wrath will come down upon him and the last three and a half years will be horrible. You can't imagine what will take place there. People wanting to die and they will not die. Pestilence and diseases and creatures of all sorts and revelation that it talks about that will bring persecution and uh, pain and suffering and uh, a chasing of Israel themselves by the Antichrist wanting to kill every Jew that he possibly can and they run over to Jordan and Petra hide themselves and God protects them from uh, the Antichrist but yet those that couldn't make it there will all be killed and taken into captivity probably beheaded as many will be beheaded who uh, name Christ as the Messiah during that time it's a horrible time and place let's go ahead and read the introduction here verses 1 through 3 the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus speak the Lord God of Israel saying, write in the book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord. And I will cease or I will cause them to return to that land that I gave to their fathers that they shall possess it. Now Israel will return to their land. But Jeremiah is not talking about returning back to Jerusalem from the Babylonian captivity here. He's talking about a future event. Because even though they went back to their land, they were not a nation. They weren't gathered together as, as a mighty power as they are today. And so he's talking about a time, a future event, where God will gather his people back together. If you look down at verse 24 real quickly, it says, in the latter days, you will consider it. In other words, this is something, this chapter, 
you're going to have to think about later on down the road. They wouldn't understand it at their time when Jeremiah was speaking this. But we do now because we've seen it fulfilled completely. It was May 14th, 1948, when Israel became a nation. A nation. They had been scattered through this captivity to Babylon. Some were brought back to Jerusalem. Some left to Egypt. Some stayed in Babylon. They were scattered all over the world. They regathered some to Jerusalem during the Roman Empire age. And then in, in AD 70, when, when Nero came in and destroyed the temple because of its wealth and the, the hatred of the Jews and it's trying to uh, rise to power and blaming things on the Jews, which was an easy scapegoat for him. So he pretty much scattered them from that point on. And so then the Jews scattered throughout the world, many of them going to Europe, or Russia. Uh, we have them in the United States and various places. They were scattered all over the world. Now think about this. They were once a great nation. They're in Israel. They've been scattered for, for thousands of years. And then all of a sudden, 1948, because of social, political development there in Europe, some of the Jews needed their own country. Uh, they thought that it was the right time to possibly establish a, or reestablish their homeland. And so they decided to go back to Jerusalem there. So 90% of all the Jews went back to Jerusalem and began to... Uh, populate that area and then in 1948 because of those that were for it especially in, in Europe and Britain there who controlled most of Palestine there allowed them to take over that place with with the agreement that the Palestinians that were there that did not like Israel coming back and taking control of that land though they never were there themselves they had a few people there but they fought it and so they agreed to have some land for themselves and if you look at a map and i should have brought one in but if you look at a map of israel you will see that israel is kind of like an s shape back in 1967 and and here is a lot of the palestinians and down here is the palestinians so it kind of wraps around here well then israel later on because of the hatred and this was this agreement though they made this agreement to to occupy in peace together they didn't keep it and so Israel fought against them, uh, Jordan, uh, Egypt, Iran, and all those various areas. And, and they were able to take all the land and push them back. And so now they occupy all of Israel except for a little part there in Gaza. I don't know if you heard this, but Monday night, President Obama, and when I say President Obama, it's his, his speaker who represents him, basically said <clears throat> that Israel needs to, and they're not asking, they're telling Israel to go back to those 1967 borders. And so he literally called them out and says, you will go back to those 1967 borders. See, they wanted, they wanted Netanyahu to fail as prime minister so that this other guy that was going to rise up who was more liberal and, and, and willing to go back to those borders, they were going to then make a deal with Iran. And that was just one step closer to annihilating Israel when you think about that map and some of you may have this map in your mind <clears throat> of Israel if you can picture Israel if they would have went back to that border they would have had a strategic place to just fire missiles right all over Israel and just pretty much kill them all but right now because they're not at that 67 border they have the, the this great uh, mountain range that just stops them from doing that Israel has enough time that they can you know shoot off those patriots and and stop those missiles from hitting them so God just has perfectly protected them up to this point but I find that amazing because one of the prophecies of the end times is that everyone will be looking at Israel and everyone's looking at Israel right now the whole world was looking at this whole election with Prime Minister Netanyahu and then his speech to to our you know Congress and then and then the speech afterwards I mean Obama wouldn't even talk to him wouldn't even have a meeting with him the guy hates him he hates Israel it just looks very clear that he has no desire for Israel whatsoever I, I don't know why that is the enemy and so forth this anti-semitist uh, that just seems to be spreading around and so the whole world's looking at it and now on Monday night Obama says hey they are going to go back to the 1967 borders it was almost like uh 650,000 Jews uh, who went 
uh, back to those 1967 borders back then. There is an anti-Semitic movement that's, that's moving in the church itself. There are pastors and there are estimated to be tens of millions of individual Christians around the world who love and support Israel and the Jews there, but yet there are mainline Protestant churches that have been actively boycotting and encouraging pro-Palestinian activism and demanding that, that we stop Israel. Mainline Christianity, who are anti-Semitic, they hate Israel, including the, the Catholic Church does not like Israel. I was reading a blog, and it's called Hate Watch. Listen to this. Three Phoenix area rabbis were recently tricked into participating in the production of an anti-Semitic film by Steven Anderson, the Arizona pastor who has made headlines with his um, rants about uh, LGBT, the gay and lesbian th movement, people and President Obama. Anderson, whose temple-based faith, Temple Baptist uh, Church, is among the most hardcore anti-gay uh, and lesbian hate groups in the country, has attracted attention for his rants, wishing death upon President Obama, uh, upon gays, lesbians, as well as declaring that birth control was turning American women into um, prostitutes. That's a nicer word. At one point, Anderson was tasered at the checkpoint on Mexico borders while defying a patrol order. He recently made headlines by predicting that America could have AIDS-free Christians a AIDS free Christmas if all gays were killed and the Bible demands it but in recent months Anderson's ministry has also taken a deceitfully anti-semitic turn as uh, Stefan Limons explores in a recent Phoenix Times post Anderson has given sermons preserved on YouTube covering su such subjects as the Jews and their lies Hebrew roots movements exposed. The Jews are anti-Christ. Jews worship a different God than Christians. The Jews are the racists and the ever populated, the Jews kill Jesus. These guys are fanatical. They're, they're just way out there. And there's a lot of these guys. And if you just Google it, you'll, you'll see all these, these Protestant churches that just have a hatred towards Israel. God's not through with Israel. Romans chapter 11 is clear. God is clear in Revelation. God is clear right here. There's coming a restoration for the children of Israel completely. And the church is not Israel. That's what they call replacement theology. Replacement theology says that God is done with Israel because the Jews killed Jesus and he can't work with them anymore. So we don't care about them. God has replaced them with the church, and that's why he raised up the church through Jesus Christ to reach the Gentiles. So we are the spiritual Israel. And so when Israel is mentioned in the New Testament, it's speaking about the church. Well, the only problem there is that that means the church is going to go through the tribulation period if we are the spiritual Israel. But we're not the spiritual Israel. They're still in Israel, and we need to love Israel we need to support Israel as much as we can. In fact, there's a scripture in Genesis that says, those who hate Israel will be cursed and those who love Israel will be blessed. And so we bless Israel. We as a church ourselves, we actually support ministries in Israel trying to get the gospel out to the people there in Israel. So we send funds to uh, certain groups out there. In fact, you saw Bill who came out months, uh, just last year and he was in Israel and we supported him while he was there. So this is going on today, th this hatred. Now that's just the introduction. Let's go to verse 4. As a day of terror and a day of hope. Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. Now that's an interesting question, huh? Is a man ever la in labor with child? Our answer is what? No, <laughs> men don't have children. Of course, if you are Oprah Winfrey and you, you uh, broadcast a special report that the first man to ever have a child, and it wasn't a man, it was really a, a, a woman who became a man. It's crazy stuff. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? 
and all faces turned pale. There's going to be fear. They're trembling. It's a horrible time. At last, Hebrew, at last, this is like, man, wow. For that day is great so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Who's he? Israel. Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation period. A time that is so great, there's never been a time like it. And you just read the book of Revelation and you see, wow, there's some things that are going to happen that, that are going to be unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, hatred and horror and crimes and, and so forth just to survive during that time. A horrible time. But yet the Lord brought hope, but you'll be saved out of it. So they will have to go through the tribulation period, just like Noah and his family went through the storm in the boat. That's a type of God's protection upon them. Uh, just like the people uh, in Egypt went through the wilderness with God's fire and clouds, God was with them all of the way. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went through the fire, but God protected them while they were in the fire. He was always with them. So typologies of God being there with his people to protect them. And by the way, God's with you. He's with you, and he loves you, and he's going to protect you too. And if some of you are going to go through the tribulation period, I don't know. He'll be there with you too. It's going to be a little tougher, but I hope you don't. I hope you choose to not go through the tribulation period. And the signs are there. Uh, <clears throat> recently, they just uh, started putting chips in people's hands. And they've got the tools and everything, and they're able to just stick it right in the, under the skin. And, and some companies, they, they use these chips to get into the buildings. They don't need, need any IDs anymore. They just come up, and they scan them, walk in and out, and so forth. So this technology is here. I really believe this is part of the technology uh, of the end times. I mean, I can do everything on here. I, and if I was smart enough, like this smartphone, I, I could look up you, and I would know exactly where you're at because you have your location thingy on. <laughs> someone did that to me. I was out in Marietta at a conference, and then someone texted me and said, hey, let's, head, let's do lunch. I, I see you're in Marietta. I'm like, how did they know I was in Marietta? I, and I asked them, how do you know I'm in Marietta? I didn't tell you. I'm like, oh, so I located you on your phone, and you're sitting right there at the uh, conference in the hot springs. I'm like, what? I go, how do you turn this thing off? <laughs> you know, I don't want anybody knowing where I'm at. But the technology is here. They know exactly where you're at. Um, my car. I just, uh, you know, it got totaled. I didn't tell you that story. Uh, I got into that little bumper thing. To, and, and so I sent it out to the place to get it fixed, and they totaled it. So now i got to buy back my own car, which is ridiculous. But they gave me this sheet. And it's amazing how much information they have on me. They got all my records of, of my last accidents. They got mileages that, that I've, I guess I gave mileage here and there at DMV, smog checks and various places that they wrote. I mean, everything's so like, wow, they've got everything on my vehicle. Thus, they have everything on me. It's just amazing how they can keep track of us completely. Everything that you do on your computer, the IP Numbers are keeping track of everything that's going on, where you're at, and so forth. you got to know how to get around that stuff. Nations are against Israel. A, a, another sign of the time is that there are nations against Israel uh, wanting to annihilate them. Look at verse 8. The Lord will break the yoke. For it shall come to pass in that day, so the great day, Jacob's trouble, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck. And will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will rise up for them. Now, he's speaking spiritually here. So when you read chapter 30, and actually the next four chapters as we go through it, he's speaking spiritually. Uh, he, he's giving us types. So David is not, he's not talking about David. He's talking about Jesus, uh, the offspring of David, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Uh, whenever you see it spoken that that something is going to be complete uh, and set in stone in a sense like no one will ever you know enslave you again well that will only happen at the end 
when it's finally all over. After the seven years of Jacob, what he's saying here is there's going to come a point where Jesus Christ himself, during the millennium reign, will rule and reign. There will be no more government. And we will reign with him for a thousand years. And at that point, no one will enslave Israel again. They will be free. They will worship the Messiah. They'll understand and know who he is. And, and they'll pay homage to him completely. And no one will ever enslave them again during the millennium age. So you have the rapture. You have the rapture that we're waiting for. And that is in Thessalonians. It talks about uh, an archangel and a trumpet will be sounding. And those that are in Christ will be resurrected, in a sense, raptured, caught up into the air, and their bodies will meet their souls in heaven, those that are dead in Christ. That's when the bodies meet the souls in heaven. And then we will go off and, and have the great supper with the Lord, a feast, a wedding feast, because we will see our groom and we are the bride while the rest of the world is still here, will go through the seven-year tribulation period. At the end of the seven-year tribulation period, Christ will come back, what we call the second coming of Christ. He will come back, Gog and Magog, the ghetto. We're not sure when that will happen, whether it's at that point or possibly it could happen any day now also. It may happen twice. But at that point, God will ride on a white horse and all his saints will be with him and he will judge the Antichrist and the world right there in Jerusalem and wipe them out completely. Uh, the Bible says that the blood will be so high it will be up at the, the, the chest of the horses because of the death of so many that are there. Christ will come in all his glory and then he will set up his kingdom age, that millennium period for a thousand years. Satan will be cast into the pit and bound and we will rule and reign with him there in that reign. Verse 10, therefore, do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, or, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid, for I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you, but I will correct you in justice and i will let you go another altogether unpunished so in other words you'll be punished but you will not be destroyed you'll not be destroyed it's kind of like a father you don't want your sons to be destroyed in fact that's why you punish them because you know that there could be destruction and so you punish them so they don't get destroyed and god is saying here look you will be punished and you will be scattered but i'm going to regather you because you're not destroyed at all I just read that Iran is advancing uh, now and taking cities in Yemen. They're advancing in their technology of nuclear weapons. ISIS is advancing. Russia is advancing. And all these groups that are advancing all hate Israel. They all hate Israel. The nations are gathering against Israel to punish them. But God says you'll be punished but not destroyed. Verse 12. For thus says the Lord, your Affliction is incurable. Your wound is severe. There is no one to plead your cause that you may be bound up. You have no healing medicines. All your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you for I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one for the multitude of your iniquities because your sins have increased. That is what keeps us out of the kingdom of God is our iniquities and sins, the works of the flesh, right? What Galatian talks about in chapter five, the works of the flesh and those who practice those, those works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God, the Bible says. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and even heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revilings, and the like. These are all works of the flesh. Remember Sunday we talked about 
uh, two parts of our humanity is the flesh and the other is the spirit. We're made up that way. We're made up of body, soul, and spirit. Our body is the flesh. This is the flesh that desires. When you get hungry, that's the flesh. And you've got to feed that flesh because it gets hungry. When it has passions and desires, you either have to deny it or you feed it. When we feed it, we fall into the works of the flesh that the Bible calls. And so when we begin to commit adultery, that's a work of the flesh. When you live, leave your spouse, your loved one, and you go off with someone else, that is considered adultery. And there's pain and repercussions for that. That's why God says he hates divorce. He hates it completely. And I've seen the devastation of that completely. That is idolatry. When you idolize something else other than what God has already given to you. And that's how God feels when we go off somewhere else and do the works of the flesh. He feels as though you're divorcing him. And that's a painful thing on his part. Fornication and cleanliness, lasciviousness. Uh, these are all, again, works of the flesh, sensuality, sexuality, uh, all those things that the, the world deals with. Idolatry, sorcery, which can also include uh, drugs. Pharmacia is where we get the word pharmacy from. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. Uh, those are all from self because we don't get what we want. We're going to lash out on others Selfish ambitions, really, that ought to be highlighted, is that we're self-centered people. Uh, dissensions and, and then heresies. Heresies because uh, you're trying to deceive someone to gain possibly some wealth and prosperity of some sort. So we see all kinds of heresies, false doctrines. Uh, people that don't just go through the Bible, they, they make up stuff from the Bible. There's a book... Uh, What's it called? Your God is your God. Your God is too small. And I'm going to be going through it uh, with the leadership. But it talks about idolatry and all the things that we are involved in. Uh, traditions, even traditions are idolatry. That's not biblical. Like a Wednesday night. Uh, one guy was saying that um, he belonged to a church that uh, had a Wednesday night service for the longest time. The church has been around since the early 1900s. Well, they wanted to change it to a Thursday night. And the church was in up. They were divided because they wanted to change from a Wednesday to a Thursday. And the pastor finally got him and says, wait a minute. Where in the Bible does it say we have to worship on Wednesday? It's not a biblical truth. It's something that we get the luxury of doing. But there's no doctrine that says Wednesday's the day you worship. And if you break that, you're committing some great horror and sin. And people are just so much involved in tradition and the way things have always been done. Even the United States of America... We got to remember, before the United States of America, there were just Christians living in the world. And we think the United States of America is the greatest thing that ever came. And it has been, but it's not the greatest thing. Christ is the greatest thing. And even if the uh, United States of America is, is, is thrown into the ocean, the Christianity will continue on. It will just be all over the world in different places. We, we need to get our mindset off of America, off of the president. Off of, it's us. It's us that is the problem, right? Chronicle says that. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. It's not the president. I think God's put him there to chastise the church, to wake them up. I think he's there to, to, to show that the enemy is close and we need to wake up and start praying and repent and come back to the word of God and live it. Why do you cry about your afflictions, verse 15, your sorrows? Your sorrow is incurable because of the multitude of your iniquities, because your sins have increased. I have done these things to you. It, it wasn't Babylon. It, it wasn't the other nations. It was Israel. Therefore, all those who devour you shall be devoured, and all your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall become plundered, and all who prey upon you I will make a pray Matthew 24 or 25 turn there real quick I've got a couple minutes thirty two well let's start with uh, thirty one when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory now that's at the second coming of Christ 
after the tribulation is done and he comes with all his angels in all his glory, then he will sit upon the throne. All nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. God will sit upon his throne, he will rule and reign, and he will take the nations of the world and he will separate them. As, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Goats we don't need, the sheep we need over here, the goats over here. And he will separate the, separate the righteous from the unrighteous at that time. There's judgment coming. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous shall answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you, stra- see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did you see when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Are we all connected to Christ or not? We are. And what we do to one another affects Christ. And if we take care of one another, we're taking care of Christ. If we feed one another, we're feeding Christ. If we give water to one another, we're giving water to Christ. We are connected to Christ. How will they know that you are my disciples? By the love you have one for another. How do I know if I'm a disciple of Christ? Because I have love for God's children. For God's children. Of course, the opposite is true. And he goes on to talk about the goats and how they didn't clothe him how they didn't give him water and so forth guys can i say this and ladies if we are believers you know i'm getting older now and and i'm seeing that sometimes older people have more difficulties with change than younger people i don't know why that is we get set in our ways right and it's just harder to change. And as I get older, I don't want to change. You know, and I have to change if God wants me to change. We've been living this way a long time. Why are you asking me to change? Change means uh, some troubles. Change means change. It means you know, going about things differently. And I just like things going smooth for a while here because it's been pretty rough. And I don't know why we get like that. But we need change. We, we need to grow. And so what happens is, is because we're older, we just... We stop loving, it seems like. I'm not pointing anyone out here. I'm just something I notice. And we can't stop loving. That should never stop. We should love our brethren. We should take care of our brethren. We should carry our brother's burdens and so forth. Because it shows that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. We're his disciples. Now there's a restoration that is coming. And it is for those who have a relationship with Christ. For I will, verse 17, restore health to you and heal you of your wounds, says the Lord. Because they call you an outcast, saying, this is Zion. No one seeks her. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents and have mercy on his dwelling places. The city shall be built upon its own mount and the place shall remain according to its own plan. Then, of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of those who make merry. I will multiply them and they shall not diminish. I will also glorify them and they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as before and their congregation shall be established before me and I will punish all who oppress them. Their nobles shall be from among them and their governors shall come from their midst then I will cause him to draw near and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledged his heart to approach me, says the Lord? You shall be my people and I will be your God. Isn't that wonderful? That's the heart of God right there. You know, sometimes when we read the Bible, there's just so much there, geographical places, kings, um, 
battles and wars and so forth. But really, the, the meat of the Bible reveals God's love for us. It reveals God's love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's heart to save the world. And so he takes no pleasure in the wicked. And we shouldn't either in their destruction. We should hope that somehow Obama would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That Putin, Putin, Puki, I don't know what his, what his name. Putin would come to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. That Netanyahu would come to know Jesus Christ. That's Christ's heart. That's the gospel message. That's the message we need to get out there. It has nothing to do with illegal aliens coming in here. It has nothing to do with nations and city gathering around here, Sharia laws and so forth. I know those are inconveniences. We don't like it. We want to fight against those things. I understand that. But it's got to do with everything with getting the gospel out to them. That's God's heart to see men saved there's rumor that one of these uh isa guys uh, a prince of some sort and i'm still trying to dig into it we don't know exactly who it is they're, they're, they haven't uh um qualified it yet as being true but apparently he's saying that uh muhammad and all that is false and he's accepted jesus christ as his lord and savior that's what god is looking at an opportunity to reach the lost that are so lost that all of a sudden they see one hope and that's jesus christ and we lose track of that because we do look at the peripheral things going on around us. And I'm not saying those aren't important. Don't get me wrong. Say, well, wait a minute, what's wrong with you? I'm not saying those aren't wrong or right or wrong. You know, I'm just saying keep the main thing the main thing. We're here to preach the gospel message wherever we're at. And that's why God has us wherever. That's why some of us are rich. Some of us are poor. Some of us work in, in one industry or another. He's got us all over the place so that we can preach the gospel to this world. And he's got plenty of them in, the, in these other countries too. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury and continuing whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it and until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will consider it. So judgment is coming for the wicked. It's not something that, that, again, as I said, God is not looking forward to it, but it is coming because of their rebelliousness. Now, everybody is rebellious against God. If Christ is not your personal Savior, then you are in rebellion against God. And God's only course of action is to judge you because you have not received His free gift of receiving his son as Lord and Savior. But if you receive his gift, which is available to all of us, if you receive it freely that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Messiah, and the evidence is overwhelming when you do the research. Prophetically, it is amazing, and we'll, we'll probably see this on Palm Sunday, prophetically. Uh, the prophecies pertaining to Christ. Amazing how many prophecies are spoken about Christ is coming, riding into Jerusalem, hanging on a cross. Psalms 22 speaks of it very clearly. Just prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, evidence that he is the Messiah. We have a museum in Britain that's filled with artifacts and, and materials on Christianity, on Christ and the early fathers and, and documents. It's just beyond measure, but we don't hear about it. We're not taught about it in school or anything, but it's there and it's hidden because the enemy doesn't want us to know. Archaeology, there's plenty of, of evidence in Israel when you go over there. All, all of these places have some evidence of history, but it's not about all that. It's about Jesus Christ and what he's come to do. He came to die in your place so that you could have eternal life. And he's been calling to you, and your life is messed up. You have control of it, but you're working in the flesh. You're working in the flesh. There's idolatry, there's lasciviousness, there's hatred, there's anger, there's drunkenness, all those things that will eventually separate you from the love of God. You need to repent and turn from your sins. Turn to God and say, I'm no longer going to do that, God. I want to serve you. I want to know you and you personally. Let's bow our heads.
Father, if there's anyone in here this evening that has not accepted you as Lord and Savior, I would love to give them an opportunity, Lord. Your word is very clear, Father, that we need to believe in you because you're the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can get to the Father except through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, if we just believe that Jesus is the Son of God, believe that he died to pay our penalty for our sins that we committed, Lord, and ask for forgiveness, he said he would give us the gift of eternal life. He promised that gift to us. And so, Lord, I pray this evening that if there's anyone out here tonight, Lord, that just needs Jesus Christ, that they will simply say, Lord Jesus, I have sinned against you. I ask for forgiveness. Would you help me now to live for you? Would you give me eternal life? Would you set me on the right track? Help me to turn from my old life and turn to a new life. Give me a hunger and a thirst for your word, Lord. I don't want to go through the tribulation period. I don't want to have to endure the judgment that is coming. I want to be set free and given the pass to enter into the presence of God when these things happen. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.